today we have literally 150 people in our, in our yeah. studio we have weird. we are doing this podcast in front of a live studio audience mm -hmm. normally it's just for gavin whoa <laughs> gavin did the applause light <laughs> over there and nick but we have the uh some some of the top brass from zoomies mm -hmm. and then also two uh donut hello. subscribers hello guys who won a contest yeah. to come they hang can't out hear us. you waving in the mics you have to wave louder <laughs> wave with your voices <laughs> and i was we went to the porsche experience center today. how was that an experience yeah. let me tell you if i tell me about it i wanted a porsche before mm -hmm. yeah still do even yeah. more mm. i want a what carrera s so bad a carrera s mm. a new one 4s or 2s two mm. yes nice i'm no i'm no punk <laughs> you don't need all-wheel drive. Yeah, I don't need all-wheel drive. In Los Angeles? Los Angeles? Get out of here. Huh. No. But what if it drizzles? <laughs> yeah. Well, People crash <laughs> when it drizzles here. Yeah. Is Did that you guys do the, uh, the wet skid pad thing? Yeah. What was that like? Slicky. Yeah. <laughs> Slippery, yeah. That's the uh, it drizzles in LA training. It was right pretty there. deep. That was like kind of like driving on a golf course. You ever done that before? Yeah. No. When I was in high school, my dad used to play golf like all the time. Mm -hmm. And a few times I went out into the golf course and dropped a bunch of marshmallows at night. So the birds. To piss Wait, off what? my dad. So no, then he, you think it's your ball. Oh, and you walk that's up and it's funny. Just a marshmallow. <laughs> that's super my funny. My dad would come home and be like, so you put marshmallows all over the golf course. And it's like, ha ha. That's very funny. It was me. I got you. I got yeah. you. Payback. <laughs> Jerry, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I thought I was filling in for someone. Yeah. Lo and behold, I get to you, join the band. You're yeah, guest. Guest. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about motorcycles, we, so we brought in our resident mm -hmm. motorcycle yeah. genius. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm excited. I think we're talking about uh, a person in the motorcycle community. Yes. Yeah, John Britton. Does mm. that name ring a bell? Oh, does it ever? Does it? Yeah. Yeah, this guy, uh, so as a mechanical engineer, this guy's like the goat of motorcycle guys uh, because he, uh, not to spoil too much. But because his eyes are like sideways? <laughs> his eyes are on the side of his head and yeah. he's got <laughs> growths that look like horns. Yeah, he's a he's the flounder of people. <laughs> <laughs> he eats garbage. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, this guy not only built his own motorcycle mm. but like cast the parts in a shed in his backyard oh wow and did all this like you know pre-computer days That's he's awesome. just a fascinating human. they're like people who come across maybe you should be reading this one I'll uh, this I'll out. no no okay. you read but uh <laughs> just I amazing. Once, if everyone tells you that they're gonna cast for all my young actors out there someone's like <laughs> i'm casting parts in my shed behind my house so i speak from experience don't believe <laughs> do not go there yeah, yeah. different be, type of casting that's yes. not the kind of casting you want to do you'll get burnt <laughs> yeah right. uh yeah guy's super brilliant uh Crazy story. I can't wait for you guys Hell to yeah. uh, read this because uh, I know the story. Good uh, news. You yeah. don't have to wait. Yep. Because it starts right now. There's something about the Kiwi spirit that is earnest, quirky, and tenacious. New Zealand is currently home to over 5 million people. A smaller population means a smaller amount of opportunities and less exposure for those who live there. And it often leads to people heading overseas to make a name for themselves. But... Some stay, build a life, and never leave the place they were born. These people become a big fish in a small pond, or, if they're lucky, an even bigger fish in the international pond. But is it possible to take a dip in both ponds? <laughs> Jerry, <laughs> wow. <laughs> <Ooh. Really committed. laughs> How do you make a name for yourself by staying in the same place? Where do you find the resources to create one of the most influential motorbike designs that inspired the racing world? Well, today on Past Gas, we're talking about John Britton, the engineer and designer who created his iconic motorbike in his small hometown of Christchurch, New Zealand. This is Past Gas. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Big thanks to Chime for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Your credit's a big deal, so build up yours with Chime. Just open a Chime checking account with a $200 qualified direct deposit to get started. Get started at Chime.com gas. That's Chime.com gas. 
The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank NA, member FDIC. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply. Out of network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. On time payment history may have a positive impact on your credit score. Late payment may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. Thank you so much to Indeed for sponsoring this episode. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash gas. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash gas and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Thank you so much, Indeed. Welcome to Pass Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes. I'm joined, as always, by James Pumphrey. Turn it to Max, my babies. <laughs> Joe Wepper. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? And just one of my favorite guys. <laughs> Special guest. You know Jeremiah him from Burton. our YouTube channel, yeah. Jeremiah Burton. I couldn't decide whether to say <laughs> handsome man, funny man. Yeah. Uh, good dude. I rolled it, you know. Yeah, rolled it up. Jeremiah. Thanks so for having me. I, th I think I've had a saying that I don't remember, though. You did have a saying when James was out. Yeah. And you filled in for a bit, but I can't remember what it was. Uh, can't flip on that flop. Oh, that's <laughs> great. That's yeah. great. No. That's, good. that's not, if that wasn't it, it should be. That's <laughs> yeah. horrid. Yep. Can't, flip. <laughs> can't flip on that flop. That's yeah. horrid. <laughs> <laughs> Getting that tattooed on my forehead. Oh, for sure. I don't Give think it you'll. Give it a week. Write it on your forehead on it. for a week. Okay, how about that? I do flip flop on the eyelids, and then I say, can't flip Island on that flop. Eyelid tattoos would yeah. be can't something. Can't flip on that <laughs> flop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if a little Michael Jordan mustache. I was gonna say a short word in that position, maybe not the best call. Like a mustache, like Michael Jordan. Yeah, and that. Think about getting a tattoo, by the way. Yeah. What would you go with? What are you thinking? I don't have the same one. Whatever you get. Okay. So I recently got pulled over speeding. I know. And on the ticket, it just said speed greater than ninety-five miles an hour. I was like, that'd be a pretty cool tattoo. That is cool. Yeah. I don't know where I'd put it, but. You know, I got some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, I go to you for the help on where I should put it. Where do you Small think? Small of the back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I thought you were going to give me a serious yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah. Small of the back. <sighs> so, yes, we're talking about John Britton. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we've already, we've already established. Jeremiah's familiar with the story. Uh, let's just get into it. All right. John was born in Christchurch, New Zealand on August 1st, 1950. He was born a twin to his sister, Marguerite. Uh, but because John was born 10 minutes to midnight on August 1st and Marguerite was born just after midnight, the siblings actually have two different birthdays. Has that ever happened to anyone in the history? This is the only time ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> only documented twin separation birth. That's cool because then you get two birthdays. That's why we're doing oh. this podcast. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a quirky detail that just makes sense as you hear the rest of John's life story. Ooh, a little foreshadowing. This guy's wild well, and crazy guy. Out there's more. There's more. That was it. John's experiences with early education were not easy. He was diagnosed with dyslexia at a young age, which created major difficulties for him. However, dyslexia was an important contributor to his innovative and uniquely creative nature. For example, John compensated for his disability by focusing on the visuals of his schoolwork. He studied and enjoyed diagrams, plans, and the visual and practical aspects of design. John was also an incredibly fast worker, which would both be a strength and weakness for him later in life. John was said to have had a never take no for an answer attitude when it came to his creative design and engineering work. He learned best through action and doing. John spent a lot of his free time as a child in his father's cycle shop and even built his first go-kart there when he was only six years old. Mm. I don't believe that. <laughs> what, see a that? six-year-old can not engineer and build and uh, yeah, fabricate a go-kart all on his own? Did you that's see like, that video of Raven Simone rapping when she was six? I was about to use that as an example. It's like, that's like those little kids that you see on Instagram, like yeah. rapping, it's like, we know that you know how kids actually rap like five and six year olds actually like rap? Adonis, like which Adonis, is like straight trash. Yeah, like trash because they're little <laughs> yeah. kids. But Adonis's rap is sick. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Compared to Ravens, yeah, no, dude, yeah. 
don't talk to my man like that. Five <laughs> years later, he had saved enough, enough money to make a new motorized model of the same go-kart. By 13, John was practicing practical mechanics on his personal projects. He spent his teenage years restoring a 1927 Indian Scout motorbike mm -hmm. and built out a derelict truck, which he rode back and forth to school. After high school, John completed a four-year mechanical engineering course at Christchurch Polytechnic and received a New Zealand certificate in engineering. He found work as an engineer making concrete mixers and glass kilns for a local business. John eventually joined the Imperial Chemical Industries, a British chemical company, as a cadet draftsman, where he had his hands in mold design, pattern designs, metal spinning, and various mechanical engineering design work. What's metal spinning? Dude, metal spinning's awesome. What is it? They take flat disc. So it's they do it a lot in uh, like uh, motorcycle, like tank. If you want to build like a custom mm -hmm. tank, you get a flat sheet of metal. Put oh. it on this. It's almost like a lathe that spins, and as it spins, you push the metal and warp it into the shape that you want. That's so then you cool. get more uniform. Yeah, it's like oh, that's it's awesome. using like rotation to make sure everything is kind of aligned. And it's like a dying art, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of guys, uh, if you watch, if you used to watch some of the old like biker build off shows, mm -hmm. sometimes they would take mm -hmm. their, uh, you know, tank design to a metal spinner. I saw someone make like a metal mixing bowl that way. Mm -hmm. It was really cool. And they made a little lip that yep. folded over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, there's cool. a place that I want to visit. It's like in Brooklyn of this guy who's like one of the like greatest That's sick. Uh, metal, metal spinners. spinners. Yeah, and it's in like I looked it up on Google uh, Maps, like outside a shop. It's like this very unsuspecting yeah. place you would never know in a million years. You know, and he probably just... gets a lot of orders for pizza pans. <laughs> <laughs> Being in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> in John's spare time, he continued his childhood hobby of restoring and building vehicles, including a house truck that he would travel into local coasts. A house truck. It's an Australian <laughs> way of saying RV, yeah? Is it it's a truck a with a house, house on, on the back. Yeah. While on these trips, John would study birds in flight, which inspired him to, to design an ornithopter. Oh, that's like uh, the dragonfly helicopter. Mm -hmm. So he could fly just like a bird. This project is a perfect example of his concentrated approach to design. He would study intensely through observation, experimentation, and practical application in his workshops. His skills were not confined to mechanical and automotive works, though. John dabbled in glass making, furniture making, and even once designed clothes for a fashion show. This guy had... He has ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's also dyslexic, so he probably yeah, does, man. for hey, listen, sure. I... I with this guy <laughs> yeah he's cool <laughs> yeah as someone who's literally dabbled in everything i'm like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he yeah. had me at pants <laughs> john came from a line of property i designed management. some pants you did. <laughs> yeah they'll, they'll be available at zoomies mm -hmm. for the holiday season Let's December. Go, dude. what do they Let's look go. like can huh? you describe them for in the audio uh, people? well this is part of a whole line of workwear that will be available this is this is the Very first time we're hearing this. Very time. Yeah. You yeah. haven't heard this? The audience haven't, haven't heard this. I'm saying oh. this is the first time we've heard this on the show. Yeah, so for the holiday season, we got some work wear. Mm -hmm. we've, uh, we've done uh, a lot of, like, T-shirts mm -hmm. and hats and stuff and to some good success, and it's allowed us to move into some more, like, cut and sew pieces. So we got a work, couple work jackets. We got a work shirt. It's like a pinstripe joint. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got a pair of, like, double knee uh, workwear trousers. Mm. Nice. Well, trousers, you know, <laughs> like the boys like. <laughs> <laughs> trousers for the kids. They're cool. <laughs> anyway, I'm basically John Britton. John came from a long line of property management and development workers. His family's professional background and experience influenced him to turn rundown stables into beautiful homes. For his renovations, he would source building materials from demolition sites. People always noted John's resourcefulness in materials, his meticulous attention to detail, and ability to work for minimal cost, which I assume is probably comes in very uh, handy when you live on an island nation like that. Mm -hmm. Despite John's many endeavors, though, he became seriously interested in motorbikes in his late 20s. This interest made sense with his curious nature and love for building new things, and it also foreshadowed a personal project that would change his life forever. Mm. Dude, late twenties getting into motorcycles. It's a little late. That's right? late, man. Yeah. yeah, that's what makes this even more impressive as we go along. Yeah, like last year when I went dirt biking with you for the first time, and I felt like I was gonna. Like, I felt like I was a tiny baby 
pony learning to walk, <laughs> riding oh, around. A tiny baby pony. Yeah. Like that swaddling was around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too sca- but scared. But you guys both came. Joe did as well. Yeah. That was, that so was my first time too. You guys did great. And I was like, Chair, something's wrong with the clutch. And you're like, nothing's wrong. <laughs> and then two miles up the mountain, it just <laughs> yeah. was the shifter. Uh, yeah, the shifter uh, got wore off on the uh, shaft of the transmission. And then I was just and that was going. That was up like this really silty, like yeah. fire road esque kind of place. Like if you mm-hmm. got stuck, mm-hmm. you're stuck. You're I stuck. was stuck. Yeah. I was like. I almost puked because I was exerting <laughs> so much energy trying to push it oh, out of yeah. the silt. Yeah. And I was like, this is not sustainable. And I just like <laughs> left it there and ran away. You ran away? Yeah. I ran to go get Jared. Well, yeah, and no, Jared like, and I were like chilling at camp and we're like, man, Joe's been gone a while. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then Joe, Joe comes back just like the sweatiest I've ever seen him. <laughs> I think something's wrong with the bike. <laughs> yeah. And then Jared goes, you didn't turn the fuel pump off, did you? <laughs> Just dumping fuel out while I was laying on his side. Oh, okay. I had a. I used to have a, a motor, ped, a moped. I used to have like a moped. A puke, right? Yeah, a puke. It was pretty cool. It was like a top, uh, had a top tank and like a mm-hmm. 65cc motor on it. And it's like pretty hot. It's actually called a Brighton B. It's oh, a guy man. in North Carolina who made yeah. it. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it had a, not a pump, but like Ed a Cock. valve to like yeah. turn the fuel on and off. And I went to this. Uh, like movie premiere back when I had like an agent and like like my agent like never hung out with me and she was like all right let's go to this like movie premiere together I was like cool so I like rode my my moped and like parked it outside and like we're like in the theater like this theater in mm-hmm. Hollywood and I'm like in the middle of like the whole audience and this guy comes in and goes <laughs> <laughs> hey uh does anyone have a tiny motorcycle? Because <laughs> it's dumping gas all over the sidewalk. And I had to, like, stand up. Oh, no. I was like, you didn't have to call it a tiny motorcycle. <laughs> it's a cool moped. Does anyone have a just, like, smaller than normal motorcycle? Oh, no, uh, buddy. It's certainly not yours. <laughs> so it's yeah. so wimpy, yeah. and it's just gushing gas. <laughs> gushing gas. Whoever rode this thing is small and dumb. <laughs> Did you wait to get up and just be like, I'm sorry, I have to to go to the restroom. Like, <laughs> uh, I have really bad diarrhea. <laughs> me, That's me, less embarrassing <laughs> than owning a tiny motorcycle. Oh, sorry, excuse me, I've my soiled pants. myself. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I forgot I'm allergic to popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to Juno. <laughs> <laughs> Big thank you to longtime sponsor of Past Gas. It's Indeed. That's right. If you're hiring for your business on your own, you're basically doing it on hard mode, okay? I'm talking like playing dirt rally with no assists on. It's hard, okay? But all you got to do is what I do when I'm playing really hard games. You need to breathe, take it easy, and keep it simple, okay? If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Here's why. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed streamlines hiring with powerful tools that find you matched candidates. I want to tell you guys today about Indeed's hiring platform. Candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to U.S. Indeed data. And Indeed does the hard work for you. Indeed shows you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash past gas. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash past gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash past gas and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Of all of John's creative engineering projects, the Britain motorcycle is by far the most famous. The bike and its many iterations were made by hand in John's small garage workshop. He initially tried modeling the bike after the bodywork of his beloved Ducati racer. Mm. John worked on his design for years, developing innovative crafting methods by using composite materials and focusing on performance engine designs. John was assisted by a team of dedicated volunteers in the making of his motorcycles. This team consisted of friends and motor enthusiasts who would even continue his life's work after his passing. Auto engineer Alan Wiles said, 
Joan was an inspiring guy to work with. <laughs> you couldn't help but be drawn in because he was doing such big things. The sort of things none of us would have done ourselves. It's, uh, that was perfect. Yeah. It was a recording. Yeah, that's really good. I can't believe we got that audio. Yeah, we, we pulled it from an eight millimeter tape. <laughs> yeah, it took three years and thirty thousand dollars to restore that. So. Peter Jackson so was involved. Got paid ten thousand yeah, dollars a year. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. bad. Yeah. Well, just to work on just that, to work on they that did only. Other projects. Yeah. Yeah, but it still took them three years. Yeah. Well, the tape was almost ruined. Yeah. You don't well, know the state of it. Yeah, and a lot of that time it was spent. Are like, they working on other stuff? Or is yeah, that their they own have a business. Is Okay, a okay. third party that restored this. All right, that's fine. Then. A lot of that time it was spent sitting in a solution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It was bathed in liquid. Yeah, yeah a liquid <laughs> solution. Very expensive. <laughs> liquid solution. It was like Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> During these design years, John also met his wife, Christine. And at 33, the two got married. Huh? What is with these people when they're almost named? <laughs> Kirstein. We're from New Zealand. We're from we New like Zealand. Them. We want you to think our name sounds like this, but it doesn't. <laughs> At first glance, my name is this, but turns out it's slightly different. <laughs> you think it's Brit, but it's actually Brit. It's Brit. <laughs> it's Brit. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Dave. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe these names are just from his autobiography and he's just left it. <laughs> oh, damn. It's my wife, uh, Kirstine. Kirstine. It's Kristen. It's Kristen. I told you many times, John. <laughs> no, it says Kirstine right here. Your brain's all mumbled. <laughs> John, your brain. John, your brain's all mumbled. <laughs> During these design years, John also met his wife, Kirstine. <laughs> and at 33, the two got married. <laughs> While John spent days on end designing the Britain V1000, Kirstine was building her own career modeling for top magazines. Whoa. John would be pulled from his garage from time to time as the two traveled to fashion capitals around the world for her modeling jobs. Come yeah. on. Tokyo, New York. Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, really? Like, well, she's at the Westfield Mall in Gary, Indiana. <laughs> Delamo Fashion Center. Yeah. yeah. Right next to the Ford Tempo <laughs> display. <laughs> Their three children, Sam, Isabel, and Jessica, would eventually join them on work trips to, or accompany John to races or just hang out in his garage. His daughter Isabel recalls always wanting to do what her father was doing and treasuring the time they shared, making things such as picture frames. In John's late 30s, the first two iterations of his motorcycle won Bears Speed Trials in Canterbury after they reached speeds of 247.8 kilometers an hour. How many miles is that? 175? That's fast. Right? That's fast. It's actually 153.98. Okay, sorry. Dang. Yeah, yeah. You were kind of way off. I'm, I'm good at math. I promise. Surprisingly <laughs> off. You stick to miles per hour, dude. Yeah, sorry. These wins gave John and his team the confidence to keep improving, but also let their ego run a little too far. They built their hmm. third design from scratch with a water-cooled petrol engine and a carbon fiber body. This bike represented hundreds of hours of rushed work as John pushed for it to be completed by the 1989 Daytona Pro Twins race, which is good because he's a twin. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Jared, do you know what this Daytona Pro Twins race is? What yeah, so at Daytona... Uh, now it's like the Daytona 200. Oh, okay. uh, it might have been that as well, but they have different classes. So the twins class is twin cylinder gotcha. class, uh, gotcha. a super popular class, though. Um, you know, for the longest time, all the best sport bikes in the world, really Ducati was the leader, but they mm -hmm. had twins. At uh, one point, Honda had a bike called an RC51, which is a twin. So like twins were the platform until because they got into inline fours. Doing like his own work. Is that like a lower budget class, a twin class, just by nature of the engine being smaller, or how does that work? Um, he probably was able to look at, like, you know, 
like good engineers will go study things that mm -hmm. are already kind of engineered. And so like the best bikes at the time were twins. Gotcha. So it's like, let's I go see. look at twins. But also, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit simpler in terms of you have less moving parts, mm -hmm. two less cylinders to deal with, smaller package. And, you know, I think like part of his design philosophy with the bike was, you know, to manage like weight distribution and, you know, being able to put a twin cylinder engine in a bike is you know, at the time was more favorable than an inline four. They were just mm -hmm. sized more bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any cool. engines that share, like there's two cylinders and they share a piston in between it? That like, would be one oh. cylinder. Hold on, what are you talking about? Uh, like, oh, I get it. Like two combustion chambers, but like one, one piston going in between them. Yeah, there is an engine like that. We did a B2B on like but every it's like engine. Two pistons coming together. Coming together. Yeah, it's called a. Yeah, it's called something. So oh. it's like ultra compression. Yeah. Are you talking about like like you have a piston face, the t the head is this way and the head's that way, and it's going like this into like firing back yes. and forth. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. Can we make it? Maybe. <laughs> the problem is, is like you have to. You're you're trying to do linear to rotational. So when you do this, yeah. you're not getting any rotation. What if it was like a magnet in between in the cylinder, Whoa. and you're using combustion to create electrical charge at the mm, magnet going up whoa. and down. Oh yeah, move a magnet. Yeah. When you move a magnet across a wire, you get current. As you say. Space, kind of see, look at Nolan. Magic. Nolan just solved the world's biggest problem. Yeah, using gas to create <laughs> very little <laughs> electricity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there I mean that is a way on like how people um take gas engine they're like hybrid mm -hmm. S type. That would be like a hybrid yep. kind of deal. Mm -hmm. The bike right, so that'll be the new video. You yep. have two weeks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's go see if we can let's build go. it. Yeah. Yeah. Max already made the thumbs, so you have to make it look exactly <laughs> like that. We built a new engine. <laughs> That's the title. Send it. Yeah. The bike had many difficulties at the race. It didn't even have a muffler. One of John's team members had to go out and buy a can of baked beans, empty it, <laughs> okay. and poke holes on one end, and then wire it over the exhaust. He didn't even eat the beans? He didn't even <laughs> eat the beans. <laughs> you, we don't know. We're speculating. We're yeah. speculating. Okay. I bet he ate them. I bet he ate them too. I cold. Bet he, cold, though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's like... He's like, hurry up. He's like, I don't want to waste the beans. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's on the beach. It's like Daytona. Yeah. It's hot. like hot, humid. Yeah. <laughs> 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 They've been in the truck the whole drive back. <laughs> The American officials, who were known for being sympathetic to the little guys from New Zealand, took pity on John at the Daytona race and still let his bike through. Sympathy only got the bike so far, though. It completely failed after rounding the first corner of the track. Uh oh. <laughs> well, so I ate them beans for nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sharing a room with him again. <laughs> John later confessed that the Daytona trip was a bit of a premature job. Regardless of the bike's defeat and the team's slight embarrassment, John didn't take this loss to heart. He was more proud of himself for trying rather than upset with himself for losing. His career would become what it was because he never saw failure as a setback, but as a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Good motto. Good mm -hmm. motto. Learn more from your failures, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why you I never should try anything. and succeed every once in a while. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like to fail a lot, yeah. and I like to only fail. Yeah, yeah. I only. And fail. then I write books about it. You drove a Civic on one sell. wheel in your last race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a great failure. That yeah. was sick. That was sick. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Uh, okay, everyone name their biggest failure right now. Go for it. I was... This is literally Nolan's first job. He has no <laughs> failures. <laughs> no, I've got. I've got failures yeah what? right when i flunked out of college uh, the first time yeah but you flunked into here and now you're famous <laughs> I, didn't flunk, I didn't flunk into here dude you flunked in here that's not what happened you showed up you're like i ain't got sh nothing and to do you, yeah. you said okay let him have a job that's <laughs> yes. not my fault it was early enough it was early enough, it was early enough. It was early enough. We, you had a good work ethic yeah. I got very well. I, I'm saying you flunked I, out of college I, into here yeah, and were I, successful. I, I learned no, no. Mm -hmm. I flunked out of my first college and I went to college again because mm -hmm. I learned that hey, maybe you got to 
try. try. You got to be persistent. Yeah, yeah, Things don't just fun. work. Yeah. Uh, and then I gained that work ethic mm -hmm. the second time I went to college, and mm -hmm. I think that's what helped me get in here. I yeah. love and also, very lucky with the timing. <laughs> very good timing. <laughs> I love the fl phrase, flunked in, though. Yeah, yeah. Flunked, yeah. In here. flunked in. Flunked in, man. Anyway. Uh, Jeff. Jer? Uh, what failure do I have? Uh, where do I start? <laughs> uh, I fail. I uh, I wanted to be a doctor, so I uh, hmm. I didn't get into the medical schools. Mm -hmm. And from that, I was like, well, you know what? Time I to go try to be a comedian. Flunked, <laughs> another guy flunked, flunked into in, here. Yeah, I flunked right into here. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> me not getting into medical school Dang. made me like realize. Dr. Burton. Like, yeah. 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 That his mom is still upset. She's furious. Is she really? Yeah. It took her a long time to get wow. over it. She's she finally over it now. Was she a doctor too? No, my dad. My dad had a PhD, so like that was like you know, okay. yeah. oh Jer Jeremiah's going to be yeah. the next. You still worked on like. Stem cell stuff. That's yeah, pretty doctor. I got a I got a master's degree. Oh, yeah, you like work in labs and stuff. How is that? Dude, listen, you, I'll let you meet my mom. Okay. You'll be like, oh, I get Bring it. her in. <laughs> let her yeah. stay for a week. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's have yeah. your mom guest in every video for a week. <laughs> yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Okay. Cool. All right. Cool. Well, like we said at the beginning, John did not take no for an answer. As he entered a he's he took on for an answer. Ah, dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> As he entered a new decade of his life and turned forty, look, I can say I, I can say you can I say because you're. Dyslexic. I wear glasses. I'm, I can say this. no. <laughs> uh, as he entered a new decade of his life and turned forty. John went back to the drawing board, determined to perfect the Britain V1000 motorbike. John designed an aerodynamic body and made the wheels super light. The Britain V1000 had no frame. Well, which allowed the engine to be a fully stressed member of the unit <laughs> nice. in that all the bike's components were attached to the engine. Mm -hmm. John designed this new engine from scratch, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Though uh. it was composed of some outside manufacturer specialist parts, it was mostly locally crafted. I'll just go down to Christchurch and find some crud pop lying around. Pop on down to the shop. <laughs> on down, you can't, John, you can't just <laughs> pop on down to the shop and buy a custom VF1000 motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to the engine switch up, John got rid of the framework chassis to keep the bike's wheels in line. The wheels were connected to the bike's crankcase, and John countered this design choice by beefing up the strength of the metal in the engine castings so they could do the chassis's job. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. The bike's radiator was moved from its usual position in front of the engine. Instead, John tucked it under the seat where it wouldn't disturb airflow, and the air fed into the radiator from its ducts. The engine was made perfectly compact, and it was the same width as the tires, offering minimal resistance. Uh, that's insane. He also managed. He also designed the front suspension in a radical double wishbone shape, so the bike could take corners faster. The Britain V1000 was in the twin-engine superbikes class, which made it possible for private individuals to design, engineer, and race their own creations in competition with large manufacturers. And finally, all of his work was about to pay off because John and his team entered two new V1000 motorbikes into the 1990 Daytona race. Mm -hmm. Getting serious. Sounds insane. Well, usually when you hear about engines being like stressed members, mm -hmm. it's usually on like open wheel cars where the mm -hmm. suspension attaches direct to the engine itself. Right. I've, are there a lot of bikes that do this now? Or? Not, um, uh, some, uh, yeah, there are some bikes that like am use this type of design mm -hmm. uh, you know traditionally you have either a trellis frame or mm -hmm. you have some sort of you know rigid structure engine sits in it everything attaches to the frame mm -hmm. this was unique in a sense of that the yeah the engine is the thing that you attach all the parts to i'd be a little nerve it'd be kind of nerve-wracking to ride this thing i think yeah i think it was pro probably pretty pretty wildly uh uh i've seen some video of it in the past and the thing rips mm -hmm. for sure and it's like the guys who test piloted this bike, I mean, you're basically hopping on some dude's like <laughs> mad scientist creation. Yeah. You're just like, all right, I'm going to go 200 miles an hour on a bank that's what's Daytona, 40 degree, or I don't know. I don't know, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, something crazy. It's sketchy. Yeah. Does that uh, make things shake loose more because it's all connected? Yeah, good question. You would think, like, because that thing's vibrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. vibrating. But the, <laughs> <laughs> but a V-twin, you know, V-twins v vibrate, but they put counterbalancers in there. And another point that you made, 
again talked about like the width mm -hmm. if you think of a v-twin like that yeah like you can't it's see not a parallel twin it's not yeah so like the width of the tire was as wide as the engine if you had an inline four they stick out like yeah. this right so yeah. like part of his whole thing was like make this thing tight skinny toy baby punch the toy, air like a toy guy. yeah you don't even <laughs> like punch a toy the air you just like sneak through, sneak through it, through it. Yeah. Yeah. Like get out of the way air yeah. yeah and relocating the radiator something <laughs> unique you know using basically ram air ducts to kind of yeah, that's shoot super air cool. through John caused a commotion among the racing industry with his bike's power and flexibility in performance, as well as their visually arresting design features. John's competitors were most amazed by the fact that the Britain V1000s were the product of a solo designer and his small crew of racing enthusiasts. They couldn't believe the bikes were made in a New Zealand garage workshop so far away from any giant manufacturer by a bunch of hillbillies and hayseeds <laughs> who couldn't even read correctly and had relations with people with almost names all the time. <laughs> That's what they said. It was in the article. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The crowd was also, hey, I can't believe these guys from minor league Australia put together <laughs> such an impressive <laughs> motorbike. <laughs> I mean, it's not the first time we've talked about this. Remember, Burt Monroe built his bike. Yeah. Uh -huh. Brought it over to the Salt Flats. The last Indian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. World's fastest Indian. I love Indian. Burt Monroe. Yeah. He's, He's like around. the Don Quixote of... And then that picture of his house was like... Yeah. Or where he built it was like that sketchy Do you remember when I was like, whoa, look field. at this high-quality picture of him in his shed, and it was Anthony Hopkins <laughs> from the movie? <laughs> <laughs> the crowd was also impressed by the bike's distinct... Guys, be mature. Deep throated thunderous growl, which was heard throughout races. <laughs> <laughs> they said be mature. That was. He was doing the sound. That was. Uh, that was the sound of the bike. Okay. Despite the positive attention, both bikes had trouble with their onboard computers that controlled the fuel and ignition. Mm. This issue inevitably slowed them down, landing them in fifth and eighth place. Hey, so he's like messing with fuel injection too. Mm -hmm. yep. That's wild. After the Daytona race, Canadian rider Gary Goodfellow took John's bike home. Most Canadian. Yeah. Sorry. Hey. hey, let's go get a Labatt's. No matter what happens in this race, let's go get a Labatt's afterwards. <laughs> well, Gary Goodfellow took John's bikes home and worked on them for several months with New Zealand mechanic Colin Dodge. That's a cool name. Yeah, I love that. A year later, Gary took one of those bikes racing again and won several races in Canada and Seattle. I didn't Which know is, Seattle had such a strong motorcycle racing heritage. Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Yeah, Portland's shitty with motorcycles. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> really? They love motorcycles up there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can't get enough of them. Yeah. I didn't say, like, they're bad. Like, that's oh. a saying, like. Oh, they're shitty with them? Maybe yeah. That's like, good. They're shitty with it. Oh, okay. Like, my sh my dog's shitty with fleas right now. Yeah. That's negative. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Portland has, like, one of the best tracks in terms of, like, like five minutes from PDX it's like in oh, the city. Nice. Yeah. And it's Dude. I think it's, like, city-owned. It's like a really? city. It's like Laguna Whoa. Seca, Whoa. where it's, like. Owned by the town so or whatever. Sick. So people will build houses right next to it. I think. And then complain. complain. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Gary even broke a lap record on one of the Britain V1000s. Nice, dude. The other bike was sent to Assen Netherlands, where it competed in a Battle of the Twins race in 1991. Despite reaching 173 miles per hour, the bike was once more set back by its electronic management system and ended up placing second behind a factory Ducati. John was disappointed. Mm -hmm. He wanted his bike to be a consistent, guaranteed first place winner. Around this time, when John was 41, his father died. Mm. John was big deal. He's a grown up. <laughs> deal with it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. What? I mean, come on. <laughs> don't be a baby. Yeah, don't be a baby. You're a grown man. <laughs> what do you need a dad? <laughs> oh, you need a dad? You're a grown up. You're old. You're good. You're good. You're grown, grown man. Is your dad freaking teaching you how to throw things still? Feel like <laughs> my dad died when I was very young. <laughs> and I rule. <laughs> I freaking rule. This guy sucks. Yeah. Turns out there's a lot of healthy conversations. <laughs> <we have. laughs> 
<laughs> Turns out this guy is not so good, huh? <laughs> Baby. <laughs> Jerry, we were so happy to have you on the time. <laughs> <laughs> John was forced to take over the family's property management and development business. This was a big undertaking that stole a lot of time from John's motorbike design work <laughs> at a time when he wanted to improve. Oh, I really want to tell me. I kind of, as, yeah, I see it. He's like, yeah, really sad my dad died, but man, this I bike's going to be sick, though. <laughs> this bike's going to be sick. Yeah. Got to go freaking manage. I wish I could stuff. go work on the bike right now instead of. Bikes Taking care of my freaking, dad's affairs. Yeah, gotta go <laughs> collect rent checks and stuff. Yeah, gave me a successful business that <laughs> gives me money to fund my dream. My dad sucks. <laughs> he later said, You're never gonna beat a wax Ducati by building the same sort of bike. You're gonna have to do something quite radical and new. Despite his familial obligations, John still wanted to meet the New Zealand racing circuit deadline in January of 1992 and race in Daytona two months later. All right. And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> no. JK. After the dust settled, uh, John set up a whole new workshop with secondhand lathes and milling machines or mills in another part of Christchurch, New Zealand. There... He planned to make the Britain V1000's new engine while focusing on the bike's bodywork in his original garage. John's years of study and experimentation finally paid off in his new and final version of the Britain V1000. John focused on the bike's initial principles, okay? He wanted it to be lighter, more mainstream, and faster than any version before. All great goals when trying to improve something. <laughs> more mainstream. Nice. John improved the suspension system and wheels, and the bike remained slimmed by placing the radiator horizontally under the bike's seat once again. Oh, horizontally this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. The empty radiator space was filled by the rear shock absorber to keep the bike and rider's weight forward. John also nice. positioned the, V20, the V20 engine at a 60-degree angle and mounted it forward for better weight distribution. Mm. The bike's cylinder heads and ports were the most innovative parts of this iteration. John's team used clay models for the port's lengths, which were then used to make casting molds for the new heads. Whoa. The bike's front cylinder head lugs held the rear shock mount, while the rear cylinder lugs supported the radiator and seat. So each exhaust valve had its own exhaust pipe, and they were tucked in close to the chassis and are considered... One of the more uh, the bike's most distinct features that as sounded insane. The bike's functions were now properly recorded by the onboard computer. John ran a new engine management program that sampled and processed the bike's temperatures, mixtures, speed, throttle position, and exhaust every few hundredths of a second. And it gave the rider an instant and precise understanding of what was happening internally as they rode. That seems pretty innovative, mm -hmm. innovative. Yeah, for the time. It was 1992. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, to do that was pretty... Uh, Pretty ahead of his time. This yeah. is like the best case of ADHD. Yeah, this guy's this guy's killing it with like, ADHD. Like I would have stopped when I like <laughs> didn't have enough metal to put two wheels together. I feel like that's the thing with people with ADHD. You're all over the place until you find something that yeah, like really, really talks to you, yeah. and yeah. then it's like now yeah. you're off to the races and you become obsessed with it. Uh huh. And then you discover a new hobby two weeks later. Yeah. And buy a bunch of equipment. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of stuff. <laughs> bunch of RC car parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the wishbone suspension at the front of the bike was another innovation by John. Motorcycles traditionally had telescopic suspension, which relied on sliding bushes to allow for vertical wheel. Bushings? Mm. Bushings. Uh, eh. They're not vertical. You have I'd say station like, tubes, stanchion tubes that go inside fork tubes. Yeah. It's yeah. like your normal fork design. Yep. Yeah. Instead, John built his with carbon fiber that had roller bearings inside sets of aluminum wishbone forks. Where is this guy getting all this carbon fiber? Well, remember when he was younger, he worked at a like composite like mm -hmm. molding place. Oh. So he probably learned some sort of skill on how to lay up fiberglass because he did all this. Like if you watch, there's a YouTube kind of documentary on mm -hmm. this, and he you'll see him in his shop with all the molds. Oh, you know? dang! Yeah. So you think he would just like make a mold? And then take it and be like, hey, can you lay up some fiber? Mm -hmm. I think he laid it over. himself. The carbon fiber? I think initially, yeah. Because I, I don't know, we'll get into it, but I think there was a time when, like, one of the, like, the tank took something, like, I don't know, six, eight months to make. Wow. You know, like, it was, like, this crazy process. Is that an autoclave? 
Yeah, I don't. I, he must uh, fix this guy baking all this crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this uh, fork design sure, allowed. Did the... you buy a pizza company? <laughs> This fork design allowed the bike to efficiently absorb bumps and gave the tires better grip. The bike could corner faster, brake harder, and accelerate quicker with complete rider control. The chassis had wheels hanging off an engine, quote-unquote, and was almost fully made of carbon fiber, a material that was not widely used at the time. I mean, I think this is around the time that F1 is starting yeah. to use this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. this is Ayrton Senna's McLaren has that carbon fiber monocoque at this time, and now he's <laughs> John's got it on his freaking motorbike and... In New Zealand. In New Zealand. New Zealand yeah. of all places. Stressed Crazy. member. It's a stressed, stressed member. member. While those details may feel like an overload of jargon to someone like me, in short, it means John built the version of the Britain V1000 that was unlike anything the racing industry had ever seen. He went through many trials and tribulations to complete the finalized design by the time he turned 43. I mean, this what? does sound like something that would be built today and be yeah. considered groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you were to go do this today, it would be impressive. Yeah. This guy did this back early 90s. I mean, obviously, it took multiple years. And did it before they had internet. Yeah, yeah. when Rocco was Yeah, on. you couldn't even <laughs> Google this. Right. It was cool. So he would, like we talked about before, him creating his own engine platform and, like, doing the uh, castings himself he would use uh, water from his pool to like cool the molds uh uh to break and he's got a pool off. this guy's yeah, awesome he's got, free, I was gonna say, he's got a freaking pool his that's wife that's the most impressive it. thing i've heard this whole time he can swim he can he swim. He <laughs> yeah. and his model wife would just be like oh, yeah i forgot his wife was a model <laughs> this guy's life is awesome crimspeen What's her name? Crimspeen. Crimspeen. <laughs> Crimspeen. <laughs> the new bike represented a massive leap forward in both engineering and aesthetics, as its main design choices were made for the purpose of speed. From the exterior color choices to the intricate internal mechanics, the bike was ingenious and left spectators and competitors speechless. We should mention this thing's blue and pink. Yeah. The the When you see this, I remember when I was a kid and I saw this bike and I was like, Oh man, yeah, this is a cool bike. Yeah, it's like that's pink. what a motorcycle looks like. Yeah, it's hot pink, blue. You have the ceramic coated, or they may have been painted at the time, headers mm -hmm. that look like intestines that are also blue. It has that front fork that's so unique and different. I mean, it's just like yeah, cool. To get a picture of what John Britton looks like too, this picture we're using, he kind of looks like Cody Co. A, a little, little bit, bit, yeah. As well, and that should be noted. His he's dressed really cool too. Yeah. He looks oh, awesome. Yeah. Handsome dude. Got Handsome a cool dude. bike. Has really a cool, cool haircut. Everything has is working role. out. His wife's a model. He's got three kids, so you know everything works. A swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a oh, swimming it's got an pool. open. Is that an open dry clutch on there, too? It, he may have used like a, a Ducati style, yeah. yes. Oh, a dry God. clutch. It looks like a it looks like a land speed bike. Sort kind of. of. So this part does. You can play guitar. Part. Yeah, yeah. Right that here. dude could shred, by the way. So he like wireframed the whole. So that's how oh. he laid up the carbon so fiber. Just, so Joe's showing us a picture. Yeah. He used like a wireframe of the the bike so he could lay his carbon fiber over that and mold it that mm -hmm. way. Get the design. That's Whoa. super cool. I'm going to make a motorcycle. <laughs> the new and innovative Britain V1000 motorbike made its debut at the Daytona Battle of the Twins in 1992. But sounds did, like a, like a, a a wrestling event. Like Daytona some... Battle of the. It sounds like a Battle of the Twins. I just keep thinking of Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> Battle of the Twins. <laughs> you love those guys. Yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. Okay, so it debuted at the Daytona Battle of the Twins in 1992, but didn't get its first victory until the International Battle of the Twins in Assen, Netherlands. Motorcycle racing is awesome, but if there is an actual International Battle of the Twins competition... International Battle of the Twins. Just sets of twins just... Dude, it'd be the shit so out of each sick. other. I would love that. I would go. It'd be awesome. I yeah. would be like, guys, I hate this my is family. <laughs> no, 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 they're working together to beat up other families. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was the twins no, fight. I think like remember like no, the old double teams. mix. Yeah, yeah, teams of twins. Teams yeah. of and twins. you have different classes. So you have girl twins versus girl twins. Yeah. You have boy twins versus boy twins. You got mm -hmm. weight classes. You have boy girl twins versus boy girl oh, twins. Yeah, old twins yeah. versus old yeah. twins. <laughs> old twins. <laughs> 
It's like take every twins double. Twins who still m- wear matching clothing. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's their own division because they're division, weird. They're like right. they're over 30 oh, still yeah. doing that. That's a whole class. Yeah. 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 That's twins. the premier class. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just premier mental illness. They, they, have, they have their own language. <laughs> yeah. One, yeah. Yeah. Feral twins who invented their own these, way of communicating. These ones are both married to different people, but they all live in the same yeah. house. Oh, twins yeah. that married other twins. So now yeah. the kids that they oh, have are also yeah. twins. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh my God! Twins that There's not enough twins. DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the kids? The of cousins are two, twins now. The they, they are biologically the yeah, like sister and brother. So that's their own class. That's yeah. like yeah. that's like the unlimited class. <laughs> yeah. For yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, But it's like the really unlimited <laughs> twins. <laughs> you thought you thought you thought you knew up people well look at this yeah look their bones are like chalk and their skin is see-through <laughs> they can't be in the sun ever <laughs> their eyes are pinker than the night <laughs> what <laughs> they're, all, the night they're also albino uh, yeah. what we're saying. look how sharp their teeth are do you remember the old double mint uh, commercials in the nineties, so, vaguely. Uh, Double yeah, Mint yeah, would yeah. always have twins in their yeah. commercials. Yeah, that would be its own class. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> those guys <laughs> coming back. Twins. Yeah. Famous twins. twins, famous twins. Cole Spr- Cole and Dylan Sprouse. Cole's f-ing guys cleaning up. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cleaning up that the Olsons. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of run the show. They're smoking yeah. cigarettes. Oh yeah, they're they got they're smoking cigarettes with like the thing that you can put the cigarette in, <laughs> yeah, like Corella Deville style. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Their signature move is one of them grabs the other's ankles and like spins <laughs> the other one around. Dylan Lil from Rugrats, they're showing up. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. animated in real life somehow. And you're like, how does that work? Yeah. Just two grown it's fat guys in diapers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they look really unhealthy. Okay, we need to go buy Battle of the Twins. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Battle, Battle of the Twins. The twins. Twins. We should hold it. In we got to do it too. before yeah. this episode comes out. Yeah. Though. Yeah. It's a weird pivot for Dota to like throw this international yeah. twin <laughs> battle royale. Yeah. Yeah. We're done with car stuff. We're done with motorcycle stuff. For the next six months we are not doing anything related to a vehicle unless that vehicle is a train plane or automobile taking you to the biggest twin fight in the history of the world you guys having fun up there <laughs> we're currently looking for a city to host the twin fight ass in decline <laughs> ass and said no, ass and said no. <laughs> so we're here in boise idaho boise idaho home of the twin <laughs> no it's got to be in twin cities oh it's oh, minneapolis yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, there we go, go. Oh, there we go all right let's move on all right finally <laughs> Big thanks to Chime for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. I first learned about credit score when I wanted to buy a car that I had to finance and I realized too late that I needed good credit. But if you're thinking about building credit, I think Chime is the best way to get into it. You may think your credit score is no big deal, but if you're dealing with a low credit score or no credit score at all, that could be a problem for your future financial goals. Plus, there's no annual fee or credit check to get started. What's cool about the Chime checking account is that you get paid up to two days earlier. With a qualifying direct deposit, you can get access to your money sooner. And you can ditch the monthly fees. Chime has no monthly minimum balance or overdraft fees. And you get access to 60,000 plus fee-free ATMs. Your credit's a big deal, so build yours up with Chime. Just open a Chime checking account with $200 qualified direct deposit to get started. Get started at Chime.com slash gas. That's Chime.com slash gas. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank N.A., member FDIC. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. On-time payment history may have a positive impact on your credit score. Late payment may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. (laughs) The bike's unique design (laughs) and performance left a massive impression on the crowd at the former Battle of the Twins. Uh, (laughs) It left a massive impression on the crowd, competitors, top manufacturers, and various motorcycle publications. In 1995, Cycle World summed up John's innovations best. How to make a motorcycle. Um, Uh Uh This guy's like a rebel poet. Like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Journalist. Gonzo journalist. He reads a lot of Hunter S. Thompson for sure. Oh, he knew Hunter S. Thompson, didn't quite care for him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
jealous of him. No. Oh, not? No need. Oh, okay. This guy, in my mind, stabbed him. <laughs> <laughs> not Hunter. I thought Hunter, Hunter's, Hunter means well, but he needs too much attention. <laughs> How to make a motorcycle. It's like a Sam Elliott type. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Build an engine and hang suspension and everything else from that engine. Mm, okay. While you're at it, break new ground with every component and system. The Britain had more innovation between its two wheels than most NASA space shots carried on board. Space, space shots, shots, what I call a freaking shuttle. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I call a star f- cruiser. You know he's a journalist because no one has ever came up with the term space, space, space shots. Yeah. Space shot. Yeah. Never heard that before in my Shuttle. life. <laughs> Shoddy. Mm-hmm. Aside from the engineering, what people talked about most when it came to the Britain V1000 was its color scheme. Mm. Mm-hmm. John pulled the bike's iridescent blues and pinks from a piece of hand-blown glass that he found while traveling overseas. That's pretty cool. Britain V1000's paint specialist, Bob Brookland, covered the pink and blue hues with a clear violet pearl paint, so they gave off the same sheen as the glass piece. Do you think they're talking about a ball? Well, he said peace, like, yeah. oh, yeah. Hmm. A little sleeper. Yeah, I think the guy probably, because he worked in a glass blowing place, yeah. probably would go to, you know, doesn't seem like the guy to, you know, rip one. No, but he'd picked Dude, it up this thinking. this guy totally seems like the kind of guy to rip one. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Why do you think he dresses so swaggy? He yeah. just chill. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. He's got a pool. <laughs> I apologize. He's Guy's a, a big stoner. I have... <laughs> His family's listening to this. No! <laughs> <laughs> the bike's body and exhaust system were described by rider Lauren Poole as a sculpture capable of 300 kilometers an hour. Classic Motorcycles wrote, it's the fastest work of art ever gonna see the britain v1000 soon came to dominate the international stage it recorded 39 (laughs) race victories and 12 further podiums between 1991 and 1999 as well as an impressive list of top speed records wow 1993 was particularly great for record setting with the v1000 setting the fastest top speed at the isle of man tt oh wow it also took the New Zealand Grand Prix titles, set the world record for the flying mile in the 1,000 cc and under category at 188.092 Jeez. miles per. That's Get out of here. Weird. That's so fast. In 1993, too. Yeah. Crazy. The world record for inflation, for the- that's like 240 <laughs> miles an <laughs> hour <laughs> nowadays. The world nice record job. for the standing start quarter mile, 1,000 cc and under at 134.617 miles per hour. The world record for the standing start mile at 213.5 miles an hour. Jeez Louise. And the world standing start kilometer record at 186.2. Not bad for a motorbike made in a shed. Yeah. I mean, look, it went. He did the flying mile at 188, and yeah. then improved the bike to go uh, 213 from, from a, a standing, standing start. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. The guy, and he's competing against motorcycles from manufacturers that have millions of dollars invested yeah. in their technology. Yeah, you know, that'd be like us, all four of us, being like, "Hey, let's go build something to like beat." Corvette or like Chevrolet mm-hmm. yeah. in, in a race. Yeah, it's like, oh, we can't find a Bugatti Veyron to drive. Maybe we should just make one. Make yeah. one, yeah, and beat it. Every that sent that paragraph is so confusing because every record is like, and his standing, starting, stopping record mm-hmm. is starting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> As the Britain V1000 rose to fame and gracefully handled its speedy international prominence, John, on the other hand, needed to slow down. Oh. Those close to him wondered when he would finally take a break from his work and rest. His creative spirit made him jump from project to project, giving everything he touched 100% enthusiasm and devotion until its completion. This quality is undoubtedly admirable, but also concerning for his loved ones. He worked long hours, often throughout the night, pushing himself to reach nearly impossible deadlines. John will work around the clock for days on end. (laughs) Taking catnaps on a squished out cotton on the concrete floor by the boat when he got too tired to function, said longtime friend Kit Ebbett. I mean, we've run across a lot of people like this, I think, in our in line our, of work. Yeah. Like, these, mm-hmm. this describes so many people that we've 
covered their builds or been to their shop and it's like you see sometimes that their actual life uh will peek in while we're yeah. at their shop or whatever and you're like bro you do you need to go handle that right now yeah yeah like we can stop you can stop welding mm-hmm. yeah Obsession. it's okay yeah yeah, sometimes though, but that's yeah. how what these guys are like chasing. Yeah, I mean, really, th- is. there's a reason he set all these records and built this thing that's yeah. like amazing because he put sacri- everything else to the put side, put everything to, else to the side, made a ton of sacrifices, including yeah. his pool. Yeah, dude, he be- probably never went in that thing. Dude, that water went. is green. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsten's not happy. Kirsten, Kirsten. <laughs> John was also an adrenaline junkie. His dream to create the world's fastest motorbike came from his love of speed, which bled into other interests in his life, too. He loved fast cars and bought himself a TVR Griffith and a jet boat that he eventually <laughs> sank while pushing his... <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah, dude. Jet boats are sick. Mm-hmm. When he skied, he had to be the fastest one going down the mountain at all times. <laughs> Sick, dude. <laughs> or else he'd throw a fit. <laughs> no, I'm the fastest. I'm the fastest. <laughs> John's thirst for thrill resulted in him spending a good amount of his 30s in the hospital. Ooh. While riding one of the Britain 1000's early designs, John ground down the side of his foot and ankle, Ow. which made him unable to walk for a while. Oh. He also crashed his hang glider. He's got a hang glider? Yeah. From 10 miles high. No way. <laughs> Ten, that's like no. 50,000. That's like cruising altitude. There's no like way. Seven, 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 seven miles way. high. <laughs> that's like, wrong. I'm going to the moon. <laughs> 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 Do you think he just told people in the hospital yeah, that he was yeah. 10 miles high? I'm sure miles someone high. wrote that. I yeah. know, can you imagine if he was a guy? I had to have been 10 miles high. Yeah. <laughs> so you were 20,000 feet above Mount Everest. <laughs> yeah, for real. And he crashed and you're all right? Yeah. <laughs> He's just built different. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On what should have been. There's no wind up there. You can't glide up there. There's no air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On what should have been one of John's safer projects, he fell from the upstairs of an old stable that he was working on. But according oh. to those around him, he was unfazed by this, so I don't know why I mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> he also fell off the stairs one time, but he was fine. So. That's like me, like, yeah, he once rolled an ankle. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> this is not foreshadowing. <laughs> one time he left a drawer open and hit his thigh real hard. When asked by his daughter, he said, I'm fine, while grimacing. (laughs) (sighs) Unfortunately, John's incredible life was cut short when he passed away from an inoperable cancer at only 45 years old. His funeral was held on September 9th, 1995, at the Christ Church Cathedral, and over a thousand people showed up. There were so many mourners in attendance that some had to listen to the service on loudspeakers in the cathedral square. John's service was led by a close family friend, Louise Deans, who said, quote, John told me he wanted a miracle to save him from death. I wanted to tell him he was the miracle. John's funeral procession was an homage to his life's work. His famous pink and blue Britain V1000 was ridden by Andrew Stroud, who led his funeral procession from the cathedral to the cemetery. Following Stroud was the hearse carrying John's casket. John's 1946 Triumph Gloria a car he began restoring at age 26, the Gypsy House Truck, transported all the way from Queenstown Motor Museum, and a 1968 Mercedes convertible that John had restored. That's quite the uh, procession. procession. How do these people learn how to do stuff before the internet? I think that's what helped them learn to do stuff, is not having the internet. You know what I mean? Like, instead of, like, distracting themselves with all this stuff, all this entertainment, yeah, they're yeah. out in the garage building this, this doohickeys and whatchamacallits. Time suck. It also shows you how to restore stuff. If you no, don't know how yeah, to but I think stuff. if you do it on, like, I don't know, like, you, we did stuff before the internet, you figure it out. Mm-hmm. And you have, a lot of times you have people that you can just go talk to. Yeah. Nowadays, yeah. people don't want to talk to anyone. As the procession made its way through Christchurch, hundreds of motorbikes joined the line of vehicles and people. The procession was broadcast on the nightly news as New Zealanders all over mourned the loss of John Britton. Many people consider John a genius. Quote, He had an incredibly creative mind. He could see the possibilities and the beauty in things the rest of us could not see. Said Vicky Buck, ex-mayor of Christchurch. The Britton V1000 was the only bike designed and built in New Zealand to have won both the National Superbike Championship 
and the New Zealand Grand Prix. It also set four official world speed records, all achieved in 1993. John's lack of resources are what made him such an astounding inventor. He often bought tools secondhand and convinced his friends to join his team on projects. For many, working with John was, quote, was the most exciting project of their lives. His sister, Dorenda, said, The greatest gift John had was to teach people how to come together with different skills and realize a dream. People who would never normally have done what they did came and helped him because they believed in the dream. Why is his sister 97 years old? <laughs> <laughs> and very similar to the other dude. <laughs> How many New Zealand accents I, I am like I expected to have? <laughs> <laughs> Only 10 Britain V1000 motorcycles were ever developed, and that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And they're still in existence today. There are three in New Zealand, while the rest are scattered around Europe, the United States, and South Africa. Only one of the ten bikes. South Africa. <laughs> I was mm. waiting for that. Only one of the ten bikes has never been raced and was preserved in a glass case by its Las Vegas owner up till a year ago. It was then sold to the California Motor Museum, where it is now on display. So if you want to see it, check out the California. We tried to get it for a B two B. Really? Back in the day. Oh, yeah. Dang. We were supposed to go up there and film with it. Apparently, in person, this bike is just absolutely insane. We talked about the paint job where they, like, sprayed it clear with, mm -hmm. like, a purple hue. Like, in, up close, it's, like, insane. Yeah, I want to see it. Yeah. This is the museum up in Sacramento. Oh, right? cool. Yeah. Where's Short Sam Elliott's trip. from? <laughs> we just mentioned him, huh? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we sum up John Britton? Perhaps his son, Sam, said it best. The motorbike touched people for sure, but I believe his real gift was to inspire others, to show them that with minimal resources and a lot of hard work, they can overcome any obstacle to realize their dream. Yeah, yeah that's a good lesson. Yeah, well put, Sam. Well put. Well put. John Britton. Yeah. Dude. Cool dude. Yeah, very Super cool story. Cool. That's mm -hmm. so impressive. So innovative. 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 We it's got a, some listener mail. Me, this is from Brett from Canada. Uh-oh. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Hi, Donut. I'm a massive fan of the show. Never fails to cheer me up and help me get through long days at work. It's always special to me to hear James get an opportunity to talk about Volkswagen stuff whether it be general history and info or personal stuff about his own cars. I'm currently building my first car, a Scirocco 16 valve, oh. and I've always loved the weirder side of VW. With that said, I think it would be awesome to do an episode on Carmen. That is mm. a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And or less talked about aspects of VW's history, like its influence in Brazil. We made a video co that covered some of that. Mm-hmm. I know the history you've covered on the brand so far has been pretty dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think this would be yeah. a cool way to contrast that. Anyway, thank you for doing what you guys do and keep it juiced. Toot toot. Get the goose, Brett <laughs> from Canada. Uh, Brett, little news. I blew up my golf last week. Mm -hmm. So hot dog in it. Hot dog in it. Hot off dig my friends. dog in it, man. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Jerry, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Jerry, yeah. dude, thanks for hey, having Jerry. me. Yeah. This you was such great. a treat. Yeah, dude, you, you really did add some color. Added a lot. A lot Fair of like uh, lot. explanations for how the motorbike works. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank Preach. you for having me. I love you guys. I, I love, love you. the podcast. Wow. Uh, I love the podcast family <laughs> out there. <laughs> I love the podcast. I love the podcast format. <laughs> <laughs> I love. Uh, I love you brought me in on a day where we have a live audience. Yeah, I'm a yeah, sucker for uh, you know live comedy. I love the audio audio <laughs> medium. <laughs> uh, you got anything you want to plug? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be at the Chuckle Hut. Uh, <laughs> Tonight, doing yeah. a hot tin. Uh, Tonight? <laughs> yep. This comes out in three weeks. Yep, sorry, so if you can't come, I apologize. Are you still doing stand-up? I have done stand-up maybe once in the last month. Mm -hmm. I was on a hot hot you streak were, for a yeah. while, and then I just, uh, dude, we're doing so much know, stuff it's here. A it's yeah. uh, It's hard. And I was I was becoming a race car driver. That's right. You were taking a lot of time. You know, <laughs> you're really, a lot you're of time our off. John Britton. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> I've never made anything. Um, <laughs> I'm just talking about the ADHD. Oh, yes. 100%. <laughs> You're the John Britton of making me laugh. Thank oh. you. Yeah. But thank you guys for having me. I love you. 
All right. Yeah. Cool, dude. That's cool. All right. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>